Okay. Yep. Okay, we are live now. Presenter laptop. Check one, sound check, November 3rd. And clerk's laptop, sound check one, November 3rd, sound check one. going to do one more sound check. Sound check presenter, sound check presenter number two, and we're going to go back into meeting mode.
Thank you, Michelle. Um, good morning, everyone. Quorum is present, and I would like to call the meeting to order uh, in Councillor Pearson's absence. She was not able to make it today. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website. As well, a reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible fun function during committee meetings. Members are reminded of our five-minute rule. Uh, time limit, which will be adhered to in this during this meeting, members will submit and can submit another request to speak if they require additional time to ask questions or make comments. Madam Clerk, we do have quorum. Is there any changes to the agenda? Uh, we are here. I'm hearing something else. Bear with me for a moment. Okay, sorry, folks. I was hearing two screens from in there. We do have one change to the agenda. It's item 14.3, which is revised report LS21042, FCS21108. It's the instructions regarding a proposed settlement of development charge complaint by Trillium Housing Winona nonprofit and Trillium Housing Highbury nonprofit. And that would be pursuant to section 9.1, subsections E and F of the procedural bylaw in the Ontario Municipal Act. That's it. Thank you, and it's been moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Ferguson um, to approve the agenda as amended. Are there any comments or questions? Seeing none, the electronic. Still not seeing closed. Them. Okay, it's thank just you. Yeah. Thank you, and it's unanimous. Now we're on to are there any declarations of interest? And I see a lot of people waving. We'll start with Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, with respect to the very last item in the closed session agenda, item 14.3. Uh, consistently, I have been declaring a, uh, an interest on this file. I believe it is the same one and have not been participating in the um, events to date uh, because not of a pecuniary interest, but a perceived interest. Um, I believe this uh, agency or party um, may participate in a uh, mortgage pool where Hamilton Community Foundation has been a funder of for low um, income individuals. So I'm, I'm recusing <laughs> myself from that deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you are anyways, because you're on AF&A, &A, but we'll get to that in a minute. So yeah. Councillor Partridge, then Councillor Marula. Uh, just a second, please. Counsel, uh, Clerk Paparella has something to intercede. Sorry, good morning, folks. If you are declaring an interest to 14.3, it should only be for a pecuniary interest. You don't have to declare an interest if you sit on the hearings body. You would actually just leave the room so that you don't have to be recused. But the Conflict of Interest Act wouldn't apply as that's for pecuniary interest. So when we get to that item, um, any members that sit on AFNA would just leave the meeting at that time. And that is why only members of GIC who do not sit on AFNA have received the report. Thank you. And we're on okay. to Councillor Partridge, then Councillor Marula. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Chair. And uh, two things. First of all, I am having some display issues with my, my computer. I do have someone on the way, but it will mean that I'll have to uh, shut down uh, and not participate in the meeting, hopefully only for a very short period of time. I also have an FCM uh, meeting at two o'clock, which I need to participate in, but I'm just wondering about quorum issues. All right. Well, thank you. I don't know what I can tell you right at this point. We're just hoping for okay. the best. Thank yeah, you. Just Councilor wanted Marilla. to give you a heads up. Yeah, appreciate that. Councillor Marula. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief clarification with respect to the code of conduct issue 13.1. Um, what exactly is that about? Is that, let me just open that out, up. 13.1. 1B. Oh, 1B. Through you, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, Council Marula, that is 13.1B. That is a report that went to the October 6 GIC and was already addressed. So it's just removing it from the outstanding business list. Okay. Oh, we're removing it just, so it's yes. not an action item pertaining to the issue itself. 
Correct. Is removing it from the agenda. Okay. We're just removing it. It's been dealt with. Because you know I have absolutely no confidence in, in that report. There so we go. Thank Edward. you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. And don't <laughs> cut me off again, Madam Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so now we're on to no declarations of interest. We've got uh, one uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting, October 20th, 2021. It's been moved by Councillor Danko, second by Councillor Pauls. Are there any questions, concerns? If not, please vote accordingly. Is anybody seeing the vote? I did. So everybody, thumbs but are up. everybody's thumbs are up. So if you're not, if it's not coming through, we can, I think we can safely say it's unanimous. I, I, I only see one thumb. It's, it's a big one. <laughs> well, they all, they all went up at different times. They were coming down. So sorry, folks, give me one second. I'm just going to pop it manually in because it didn't open on my system. So, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm assuming that it went through. So now we're on to delegation requests. It's been moved by the mayor, second by Councillor Farr, that we move David Carter from the Innovation Factory Synops Life Science, sorry, Sciences Consortium respecting their annual funding request for December the 8th GIC. Any questions or concerns? Please vote accordingly. And I think our voting system is going wonky here. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, um, our voting system is definitely not working properly. Um, so I am going to put everybody in. Councillor Jackson, I definitely see your thumb up there. Thank you, sir. How about if we do it this way, might make it a little easier. Whoever's uh, opposed, and we'll just assume yeah. all the others are, are, are. So is there any opposed to, uh, to approving the minutes? Of that was the delegation. Oh, the de oh, sorry, of the delegation, David Carter. Anybody opposed? Seeing none. Thank you. It's unanimous then. So we're on to consent items. This is uh, 7.1 placemaking grant pilot program update PED 248A citywide. Uh, moved by Councillor Marula, seconded by Councillor Partridge to put it on the floor. Are there any questions or concerns? Oh, thank you, Councillor Wilson. And then I have Councillor uh, Nan. Go ahead, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Chair. Um, I would um, offer my opinion on this uh, generous donation from the McNally Foundation and how it's been, um, how it's unfolded across the city is a, a, a great success. Um, and it has been an opportunity to enliven our spaces, to bring a human element to many of our spaces, uh, to engender conversations. Um, and I, I guess my question is, um, it was, I raised it last week, um, our continued reliance, maybe not continued, but a reliance on philanthropics uh, sector to add value um, to our publicly owned spaces that bring value to our citizens. Um, when might there be an opportunity or is there going to be an opportunity to, to assess at the conclusion of this experiment, if I've read the report correctly, it's been a while, um, how we're evaluating this and whether we want to and actually uh, identify that value um, in our budget expression and Oh, work. Thank you. I got uh, you. Carrie Brooks Joyner uh, with us today. So, Carrie, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, the councillor is correct that a fulsome evaluation of the program is planned, uh, but it is still many uh, months away. So, a multi prong evaluation will capture recommendations for the funding function of the program, but, uh, but also will look at the technical and logistical components of how these projects come to life in the public realm. So, we know that we need to do an assessment of possible funding options as part of the evaluation, but also high le level recommendations on whether the program should continue in its current iteration or be, with, be revised with improvements 
or even BCs to deliver by the city. Uh, if it is um, a GIC's uh, wish, I am happy to report back with that evaluation and to provide re recommendations for consideration. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you so much, um, Carrie. So just so I'm clear, I, I, I probably didn't hear you correctly. I thought I heard now two different things. At the beginning uh, of your response, you said that you were, in fact, um, going to be reporting back with an evaluation. At the end of your response, forgive me, I thought I heard you say you were looking for direction to provide that re report back with an evaluation. I'm assuming it, it is the first one. You will be providing um, that evaluative report. And if that is the case, could you just give me a sense of the timing on that, please? Um, through the chair, uh, sorry that I was not clear. The project plan always included an evaluation of the pilot. Um, and I will can certainly bring that evaluation back to GIC with recommendations. At this time, the program is going to be running well into 2022. Only three of the 10 of the um, 10 projects are um, uh, installed at this point and the second intake is now underway. So it could uh, easily be Q1 of 2023 at the conclusion of the program when we have the evaluation done and recommendations formulated. Thank you, Councillor. Thank, Thank you for Thank that. You. Um, just as um, the, uh, uh, there is a place in, in Ward 1, uh, or HAAA, which enjoyed a placemaking experience. And it's been a, a wonderful experience for the neighborhood. I, I, I really, really would like to underscore the value um, in it. And um, in this case, it was a, a series of fo photographs which depicted the very many uh, users of, of that space uh, and the variety of users um, in age, um, race, um, everything and how, how they use that space. So it, it was a great success in my eyes, but I, I look forward to that formal evaluation and appreciate your work on this front. Thank you. Um, as our clerk has mentioned, uh, the speakers list is not activating properly. So can you please use the chat? And now I have Councillor Nan and then followed by the mayor. Councillor Nan. Thank you through you. Also wanted to echo my gratitude and thanks to the McNally Foundation for the funding of this project and congratulations to staff um, who've been working quite uh, progressively and I think in a very collaborative manner with uh, many of the applicants and congratulations to all the residents who brought forward their community led placemaking projects. Uh, Ward 3 was the recipient of five, uh, which is incredible, some of which have already been implemented and others that are eagerly uh, awaited by especially children as it relates to the children's garden that will be installed into Gage Park. Um, and the question I was going to ask was an evaluative framework that's already been asked and I have no other comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now we have to the mayor. Mayor Eisenberger. Thank you. I'm hearing you very faintly for whatever reason. I'm not sure if your okay. microphone is down or not. Or is up that better? Or better. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm. Uh, I just want to express gratitude to the uh, McNally Foundation. Uh, you know, they they're, they're doing some incredible work in our community. Uh, one where uh, that we're uh, currently have been working on, Councillor Wilson and I and others uh, and staff uh, is the replacement of the. Uh, I guess the low bridge in the uh, in the valley uh, between Burlington and Hamilton. Uh, you know, we're really anticipating a, a, a significant investment that they're making to actually replace it, which is fabulous. And they're uh, they're really focused in on public realm investments over and above the public realm investments that the city is making. And so we're you know we're talking about park spaces that have amenities, but they're adding value to those amenities uh, in ways and I think that was really spectacular so I really encourage and, and appreciate the good work of a uh, you know a private foundation that wants to make uh, lasting contributions in partnership with uh, local neighborhoods uh, that is really really brilliant and uh, really want to thank them for their ongoing work and I I anticipate they'll be doing more in our community as they set up a foundation to actually create value and added value and added benefit to uh, to our city and they are doing that in so many different ways, and I, I anticipate that will continue. Also, look forward to to kind of the uh, the uh, outfall report uh, that uh, that Carrie's working on. I think it'll be very helpful to uh, to determine the the, the value. I, I have no doubt there's value in this project. Uh, I guess the question becomes uh, how do we how do we continue that value 
so that uh, placemaking and uh, adding value to our park spaces and public realm spaces continues uh, with, in partnership with others in our broader community. Very, very good effort. McN McNally Foundation and the McNally family is really passionate about uh, our community and uh, is demonstrating that in so, so many different ways. Uh, and this just happens to be one of them. So many thanks go out to them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, apparently the speakers list is now working, but you know, again, chat is probably more um, better. Anyway, so it's already been duly moved by Councillor Marula, seconded by Councillor Partridge. Any opposed? It's unanimous, clerk. And the voting system's actually working now, um, <laughs> Deputy Mayor. <laughs> That's going to be one of those meetings. Okay, yeah. Great. So if I could just get everybody to go ahead and vote, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Councillors Jackson and Ferguson, please. Thank you. Vote closes. To a unanimous again. So we're on to presentations, folks. The COVID-19 verbal update is 8.1. Jason Thorne, General Manager of Planning and Economic Development and the Director of Emergency Operations Center, as well as Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, Medical Officer of Health, will provide an update regarding COVID-19. So I am turning the floor over to Mr. Thorne. Go ahead, Mr. Thorne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I do have a couple of updates from the EOC this morning for Council. Uh, and uh, and Dr. Richardson actually I believe is away today, but Michelle Baird is here from public health if there are any questions for from her from a public health standpoint with respect to the, the vaccination program. Uh, so as I said, a couple of updates for EOC. I'll start with the an update on the city's own uh, vaccine verification uh, policy requirement for city of Hamilton staff. Uh, so as of Monday of this week, that was the deadline for staff to provide proof of uh, having received both doses of the COVID-19 vaccination under the city's uh, verific vaccine verification policy. Um, we are at about 95% of employees who have reported in with the information that's required under that policy, and about 92% of those staff have reported that they are fully vaccinated. Uh, for those employees who have not submitted their proof of both doses, um, that they will be required to enter into the city's rapid testing program. That will start rolling out tomorrow. And those employees will be required to submit testing online um, every Monday and Thursday. Uh, starting tomorrow. And those staff who do not submit their test results each Monday and Thursday as required uh, will be placed on an unpaid leave of absence. Um, as the city is rolling out this phase of the, uh, the verification policy, um, there is the potential for some service disruptions uh, related to employees who have not yet fully complied with the policy. Uh, as was shared publicly late last week, um, HSR in particular is planning uh, in the event that there are any potential service disruptions to transit service uh, starting this week. Um, as, of, uh, as of late last week, HSR was planning for up to 10% of bus operators uh, to be potentially out of compliance with the policy. Uh, although over the last several days, we have started to see more of those, those employees submitting their, their vaccine verification. Um, but in the event that there are any potential service disruptions, HSR is doing some service level planning. Uh, they'll be looking at prioritizing services at the start and end of the day uh, to ensure that customers are able to get where they need to go. Uh, identifying any high frequency routes that may be modified uh, to, to augment service elsewhere. Uh, and uh, and uh, the HSR director is here today if there's any questions uh, regarding that. Uh, we are encouraging customers to download the HSR Now app uh, on their devices, which will give them up-to-date information on any changes to schedules or service levels. Uh, and also HSR will be communicating through, uh, uh, through their media releases and social media channels on any changes to, uh, to service. Um, a couple of updates as well from Recreation. Uh, so based on the new provincial regulations that have come into force, um, there are some service changes to our recreation facilities that are now in effect. Uh, so physical distancing and reduced capacities are no longer required uh, for those recreation facilities where proof of vaccination is required, um, as well as some of the facility amenities like uh, lockers, um, showers uh, that had been closed due to those dis distancing requirements um, are now reopening within those facilities. Uh, some changes to the uh, swimming program as well. Uh, length swim capacities are up to four per single lane or six per double lane. Um, uh, recreation is still encouraging uh, people to make reservations uh, for those lane swims. In terms of winter programming, uh, planning is in the works for some of our winter programming. Uh, REC is hoping to share some, uh, some more detailed plans later this month. 
Uh, outdoor rinks will be starting to reopen once the weather allows for it, and they will be returning this year to normal capacities uh, and without a reservation requirement. Uh, similarly, our public programming at indoor rinks uh, will be returning to normal capacities, and those schedules will be coming available in the next few weeks, uh, as will information on some of the volunteer community rinks that we have across the city. Uh, with respect to golf, uh, the Shadok Bidok golf course uh, is closing as of this week. Uh, the last day to play at Kings Forest will be November the 7th. Uh, the Shadok Martin course is remaining open for now, depending on weather. And REC is looking at some uh, planning right now for, uh, for winter golf. Uh, REC has also reintroduced the annual passes. Uh, those can start being purchased this week. Um, those passes provide for four options for the public for any of our drop-in programming. Uh, they can once again choose uh, either a single admit, one of those multi-visit click cards, a monthly pass, or an annual pass. Uh, and lastly, uh, very pleased to say that the City of Hamilton Remembrance Day service will be taking place again on uh, November the 11th, starting at 1045 in the morning at the Gore Park Cenotaph. As it was last year, this year it's participation by invitation only. Um, for the public, they're welcome to view the Remembrance Day service by tuning into the a live broadcast, which will be on Cable 14 or on the city's YouTube channel, and any citizens or groups who want to have a wreath laid at the Cenotaph, they're being asked to deliver those wreaths before November 11th to the Hamilton Military Museum on York Boulevard, and then those wreaths will be placed at the Cenotaph uh, on behalf of, um, uh, on behalf of the member, uh, sorry, will be placed at the Cenotaph by the members of the uh, Hamilton Veterans Committee. Um, so those are my updates from the EOC. I will ask Michelle if she has any updates she wants to provide from a public health standpoint. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So overall, COVID-19 case activity in Hamilton continues to decrease, which is good news for all of us. We are continuing to experience cases and outbreaks, although for the most part, our outbreaks are smaller in scale. We currently have six outbreaks in Hamilton. And another positive news, our daily hospitalizations are very low. On the COVID-19 vaccine front, I have more news to share with you. So in terms of our progress, uh, the Hamilton Healthcare Partners have administered over 861,846 COVID-19 vaccines locally, with an estimated 85.2% of Hamiltonians born in 2009 or earlier receiving um, one dose of vaccine and 81.4% are fully vaccinated. We're still working toward a goal of reaching 90% of all eligible Hamiltonians receiving two doses of vaccine. And so we are continuing to encourage first and second doses if you haven't yet received your vaccine. In fact, getting first and second doses out continues to be our priority and these vaccines are available uh, through walk-in. On the vaccine front, we are actually scaling up our vaccine program in preparation for the next phase of the COVID-19 vaccination campaign. We anticipate an announcement imminently regarding the implementation of the statement released Friday from NACI or the National Advisory Committee on Immunization with respect to recommendations for third dose eligibility. Um, this is gonna impact a number of populations, including community members 70 years of age or over, indigenous individuals 18 years of age and over, high-risk healthcare workers, um, anyone who received two doses of the AstraZeneca Covishield vaccine or one dose of the Janssen vaccine. At this time, we are still awaiting direction from the provincial government on third dose eligibility in Hamilton uh, for our local rollout. With these anticipated announcements, Public Health Services is opening two new fixed site COVID-19 vaccine clinics. This morning, the City of Hamilton Mountain COVID-19 Vaccine Clinic opened its doors at CF Lime Ridge on the upper level of the mall near entrance five. A second fixed site COVID-19 vaccine clinic will open in the lower city before the end of the month. In addition, we're still continuing with our mobile clinic efforts and we'll be offering two mobile clinics daily on a go forward basis. All of our clinics continue to be posted on the city's website as usual. In addition to the clinics that are offered by Public Health Services, we're also encouraging people to receive their vaccine through participating primary care practices or through the more than 100 pharmacies in Hamilton who are continuing to offer vaccine at this point. Um, for these third doses, uh, they will be by appointment and they will be booked appointments. And so to support that booking and more local customization, we launched a local booking system to replace the province's tool here in Hamilton and the tools live on our website as of now. 
And finally, uh, as we look forward to an announcement with respect to five to 11 year old vaccines, we are working closely with partners from our local school boards and McMaster Children's Hospital to scale up operations on that front as well in preparation for the vaccination of children age five to 11. So once that approval is granted by Health Canada and we receive local direction, we'll be ready to go on that front as well. So with all that, those are my updates for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, um, Jason. Also, Laura Fontana is online if anybody has any questions. So we have a speakers list right now and it's uh, Councillor Wilson, then Councillor Jackson. Going with Councillor Wilson first, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, GM Thorne, and thank you, Director Baird. My questions are public health uh, related, please. So to Director Baird. Um, Director Baird, are you able to tell uh, the committee the status of, um, and I think I've asked you this before, so my apologies, the status of uh, the vaccination rate in um, uh, our neighbours who are unhoused, whether they be in encampments and, um, and or temporary housing? Thank you. Yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair. So this is a difficult question to answer, and I know we've tried to answer it before. We do know that vaccine continues to be offered in shelters. Shelter Health Network is doing a great job as well of rolling out vaccine within um, encampments and through uh, youth shelters, that kind of thing. The challenge is that we have... Um, it's a fairly fluid population, so it's really hard to say what the rate of vaccine is. We can say that vaccine has been offered. We could tell you um, to date there's well over 3,000 people that have received vaccine, be they staff or residents. But the challenge is, of course, that that resident client population, if you will, is quite fluid. So we really don't know what the coverage rate is on any given day within that population. But efforts continue there, and of course, that continues to be a priority population for us. In Hamilton, we actually rolled out vaccine um, to shelter staff and clients earlier than other groups because it was a group that locally we prioritized to receive vaccine. Thank you. Councillor? Thank you. I have two, I think, two other questions, and one, the first one pertains to, uh, and I know it's a bit speculative, the forthcoming announcements on uh, from the National Advisory Committee on immunization as it pertains to third dose um, details. Um, we know that uh, people who are experiencing homelessness or living in transitional housing are often have compromised immune systems and may be at a greater risk of developing um, either complications or suffering from underlying chronic conditions like asthma uh, pulmonary disease, heart conditions. So with that in mind, um, is there any sense of, uh, from public health um, on how, if, 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 if you uh, agree with that thesis that they're at greater risk, whether that community therefore will be identified um, within the third shot? Because you didn't mention them um, Director Baird, you mentioned those over the age of 70, perhaps it's assumed that under there, you've mentioned Indigenous uh, neighbours over the age of 18, um, and those who have received two doses of AZ. Do you offer any insight on that, Director? Yep, through you, Madam Chair. So on this front, with respect to third doses, I do want to reiterate that uh, first and second doses continue to be priority. And in fact, uh, having two doses of vaccine is still considered fully vaccinated. Um, the third dose of vaccine is really for select groups at this time. There's also lots of evidence to suggest and support that having received uh, first, and first and second dose of vaccine, that you still have great immunity against COVID-19 and in fact are very well protected against severe illness and hospitalization. So the third dose um, really is at this point in time, we do need to follow the direction from the province and NACI. And it's for those folks 70 years of age or over um, with the uh, knowledge that of course they may have some waning immunity at this point in time. Uh, the other group that's already eligible for third doses of vaccine and that we've been working to roll out um, individual 
homes or seniors who are living in congregate settings uh, where the majority of the people there might be seniors. So as you can imagine, some of those are um, our RCFs, retirement homes, those kinds of places. At this point in time, we don't have direction to go beyond that into those vulnerable populations that may be um, precariously housed or uh, in shelters, whatnot. So at this point in time, Councillor, we're still in a place to follow the NASI recommendation uh, for what's available. And I would say too, that we are anticipating that announcement very, very soon and uh, suggest that this is probably a first stage and perhaps down the road, we might see others, but at this point in time, that's the group we're focused on. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost time how long you've got, but I'm assuming it's coming up. So I've got four minutes left. Oh, you do? Oh, Michelle. <laughs> Okay, we'll give you four and two seconds. Go ahead. So, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Baird, or Director Baird. Just so I, I'm clear on that, when you said we're looking for direction, just so I'm clear on the roles and responsibilities, that direction of that third dose uh, uh, group is only provincially defined, correct? It, it's not a direction coming from this body. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes, you're absolutely correct that the recommendation comes from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, and then the Ontario government gives us direction uh, within the province on who is eligible for that third dose. So it's not this body. Okay, I just uh, I do have one final question, and it pertains to your first opening remark um, about the fluidity of of this community. Um, when we're going into encampments areas as per our six step process, um, what is the role of public health in that, um, in that process? And is there, um, is that exercise being used to uh, check on the um, uh, immunization status of those who are living there as an opportunity for us to try and, and vaccinate those who may not be vaccinated. Michelle? Yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair. So with respect to that particular population counselor, it's actually Shelter Health Network who's providing the vaccines on public health's behalf. So in their interaction with clients, they're using that opportunity to offer a vaccine. It's not public health that's doing uh, that actual vaccination. Thank you, counselor. Do we know uh, the which vaccine uh, is being used through you, Chair? Is it AZ or is it Pfizer? Or is it uh, through Madam Chair? At this point in time, it would either be Pfizer or Moderna. Most likely Pfizer. That uh, that is um, the larger number of doses we're giving out. But right now, it's only those mRNA vaccines that we're using. So those would be the vaccines that Shelter Health would have access to. We're not using AstraZeneca vaccine in public health. Thank you. Councillor? It is, it is somewhat related to COVID, but I just want to make sure I'm clear in our deployment on encampments, therefore, what is the role of public health? Michelle? Through you, Madam Chair. So with respect to uh, COVID and encampments and shelters, really the role of public health is offering guidance with respect to how to both proactively prevent COVID within the shelter um, system. And we do consult directly with specific shelters uh, with respect to encampments, of course, not so organized. And so that role is not, uh, not necessarily the same. I would suggest the primary role we have is within the shelter environment. Thank you. I'm, I'm just trying to thank you. Sorry, Chair. I'm just trying to understand how we are assessing and who is assessing um, the health condition of those who are encamped. And if I've understood you correctly, it's not a direct public health role, but it is through HamSmart. That's my final question. I know I'm taking up a lot of time. Yeah, no problem through you, Madam Chair. So on that front, uh, it's the individual care provider for the for the individual in the encampment, which often is HamSmart, could be Shelter Health Network. So it's those community physicians that are providing care to the clients directly. They would be assessing both what their health needs are as well as whether, you know, they need vaccine as part of that. Uh, testing, all of those pieces are all within that, uh, that uh, primary care provider. Thank you very much, Dr. Baird. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I don't have Councillor Wilson, or sorry, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jackson, you're on, please. 
Thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson. Good morning, and Good morning. Uh, thank you, GM Thorne and Director Barrett for the updates. I just have a series of quick questions for uh, our new director of the EOC, Jason Thorne, and possibly if Ed Fontana needs to uh, chime in, please do so, Laura. Quick questions just to uh, confirm and clarify, uh, Jason. Uh, since I last asked you with the provincial regulations that change, nothing has changed. We're full steam ahead for capacity limits being removed for meetings and event spaces indoors, correct? Through you, uh, Deputy Mayor? So through the chair for any facility that requires proof of vaccination, that's correct. Thank you, Council. Thank you, thank you. Um, this one may be for if Executive Director, oh, thank you, Laura, you're there, thank you, good morning. Um, E.D. Fontana, I've had a couple of my constituents, full-time employees of ours who have said to me, and I haven't asked about their vaccination status, but obviously they're asking me the question about they're working permanently from home. Do they need to still go through the rapid test COVID testing because they feel working at home, completely isolated, doing their full-time work for the city, they're not engaging with the public, and from a taxpayer standpoint, is it possibly a waste of money and time? Could you answer please through you, uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson? Thank you, Laura. Thank you uh, through you, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning uh, to Council. Good morning. So, employees that are working full time from home are your, your correct, uh, Councillor. They are also required to enter into the uh, rapid testing uh, program. Uh, we did that for a couple of reasons: uh, consistency on a corporate wide basis, so that all employees are required to uh, submit to the testing uh, if uh, if they haven't uh, provided their vaccine uh, verification status. Uh, and also from a health and safety perspective, although they may be working from home full time, uh, we are going to start transitioning back into the workplace. And there may be uh, times when they have to report to work and uh, we want to make sure that uh, they're, um, they're healthy to do so and that they uh, are able to provide a, a negative COVID test. So we, we want to ensure overall the health and safety of the organization and uh, by applying the, uh, the policy consistently throughout the organization is important. Uh, so everyone is uh, in compliance with the policy one way or another, either through the uh, vaccine verification or through uh, uh, providing their, their COVID test results. Um, working from home permanently, uh, it, you may or may not be required to, to attend the office at, at some point in time uh, without uh, notice, and we need to prepare for that eventual transition, that physical transition back into the workplace. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, E.D. Fontaine. I will convey that message uh, exactly as you've uh, shared it publicly now. I'll convey that back to my two constituents that um, there's just no wiggle room on that. I will stand by that. Speaking with employee about employees, um, E.D. Fontana, did I hear General Manager Thorne say that approximately only 10% is left within ATU and the HSR that are not uh, fully vaccinated, if true, what a remarkable metamorphosis from a couple of months ago when, quite frankly, I was dismayed, Deputy Mayor Johnson, with the ATU leadership's position. That was their democratic right, but I was dismayed, disheartened by their position, initially opposed. Um, and But boy, what a metamorphosis. If it's gone from something like 20% a couple of months ago of compliance to less than 10% now, can you confirm that? And I'm delighted and relieved to hear of this outcome. Through you, Deputy Mayor Johnson, to Laura for a comment, please. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, through, through you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, um, um, Councillor, the, uh, the numbers are, are indeed a lot better than they were two months ago. You, you'll recall we had approximately 18% compliance, and now we're, uh, we're hovering around 95% uh, um, compliance. Wow. In fact, the, the numbers that I heard this morning, and we're just we're, we're finalizing them, and we will have a, a communication um, this later on this morning to the organization. Uh, there's only a, approximately 33 employees in transit that are in non-compliance with the policy. Wow. So that is uh, terrific news in terms of our ability to uh, to provide service that is uh, you know essentially the uh, the same level that uh, we have been providing in the past. I know Maureen uh, is also pleased with uh, with the results uh, in terms of our ability to, to continue with that level of service. So uh, the 33 employees, we're hoping that that number is going to continue to come down 
uh, but we've had a tremendous response from transit and our, our thanks as well to Eric Tuck. He's been instrumental in supporting other members and ensuring that they also uh, comply with the policy. But uh, yeah, the, the numbers are, are fantastic at this point. Wow. That is sensational news, sincerely. Um, and great credit then, E.D. Fontana, to your team in HR, to Director uh, Cozen Heath and her management team at the HSR. And listen, kudos to um, President Tuck and his executive team as well at ATU. Last couple of questions then, uh, EOC uh, Director uh, Thorne. So when will my seat in the council chambers, EOC Thorne, be available for me to join my council colleagues safely. Uh, I'm double vaxxed, as everyone knows. I think we all are. Uh, the council chamber normally holds 400 people in total, just the 16 of us. The last time we met was March 20th of last year. I remember I sat six feet apart from the mayor, six feet, feet apart from Councillor Wilson. Staff were up, scattered up in the gallery. We were doing great. When will council chambers be reopened for in-person council meetings? And secondly, when will City Hall be open to the public as well, since meeting places don't have capacity anymore? That's my last two questions, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thorne. Yes, and through you, Madam Chair, unfortunately, I don't have a date for you yet. Um, that is something that the EOC is looking at, both in terms of council chambers, as well as we do obviously have various um, uh, public meeting rooms, normally public meeting rooms and public service counters. Uh, so we don't have a date for that yet. Um, I, I know that we do have the procedural bylaw in place that will allow for hybrid meetings, uh, if, if, if that's what uh, uh, Council ultimately decides to do once the um, City Hall is able to open. Uh, but I'm sorry, Councillor, I don't yet have a date for you uh, in terms of when we'd be looking to open up City Hall for, for public uh, access for Council meetings or for service counters, um, other than the, the services that are currently already available on the, uh, the first floor of City Hall. Thank so you, EOC Councilor. Director Thorne, thank you, Deputy Mayor. EOC Director Thorne, obviously it's on your radar. You take that under advisement and hopefully soon you can give us an update one way or the other. But as you can tell from my standpoint, I'm desperate to get back to that chair that's been collecting dust in the council chambers. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Johnson. I brushed it off this morning, but that's fine. Oh, thank you. So now we're on to, I believe, Councillor Danko and I'm still looking at the speakers list in the chat room, folks, so that helps. Councillor Danko, it's your turn. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, just one question on the, the rapid tested, testing program uh, that's now coming into effect. Uh, a number of residents have asked uh, what the cost might be to taxpayers. So if uh, staff could just uh, put you. that on the record. Yep, thank you. Uh, Michelle, do you have an answer for that? Through you, Madam Chair, are we speaking about the staff testing? Because if so, it's probably more appropriately answered by um, GM Thorne. Staff testing, yep. yes. Thank you. GM Thorne? So through you, Madam Chair, I'm going to refer that one to Laura. I see she's on the line. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie. So, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> third, third time's a charm. Uh, through, uh, through you, Madam Chair, there is no cost uh, to employees. There is actually no cost to uh, to the city right now. The tests are provided uh, by the province for free. Uh, uh, we, we don't expect uh, a cost associated with the test, at least uh, for the foreseeable future. So at this point, um, uh, the, uh, the, the tests are essentially free for, for both the organization and for the employees. There, there's no cost associated with it. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Good to hear. No cost to taxpayers. Okay, thank you. And that was the uh, exhausted the uh, speakers list. I do have a question, however, if if the mayor can uh, take the chair, please. Um, so my question is to Michelle. Um, I keep hearing uh, announcements that uh, showing proof of vaccination is going to be obsolete as of the new year. Is there any truth to that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So yes, we are hearing that as well. And so don't have a. a full details on that yet, but certainly we are hearing that that might come as the vaccination rates uh, uh, get higher and closer to that 90%. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Coming back to, uh, I'll take the yep. chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And there are no other questions. Oh, sorry, Councillor Clark, question about HR. So to Laura Fontana, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is with regards to uh, the vaccination verification process. 
So what I case is we are not mandating employees to be vaccinated. They're mandating that they provide us with vaccination verification. Should they not do that for whatever reasons, they have to take an education course and they have to submit to twice weekly testing. If an employee at that point refuses to um, participate in the education program or refuses to be tested, it would then become a discipline matter for HR. Is that, am I reading exactly how the policy is to be interpreted? Thank you. Ms. Fontana? Yes, thank you uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, that's exactly uh, what happens and the discipline imposed is a unpaid leave of absence. So uh, the individual uh, will uh, not, uh, not be allowed to attend the workplace. Uh, they'll be placed on a uh, unpaid leave of absence until they either um, provide uh, their, uh, their vaccine status, uh, full vaccination status, or they, uh, they comply with the uh, terms of the uh, COVID rapid uh, testing program. Super. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. No, I, I agree with that process. I really appreciate it. I just wanted to be clear so that my constituents really understood what we're doing with our employees. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Councillor Paul, thanks for using the chat line. Go ahead. Your turn. Thank you. And through the chair, this is a quick question. So we're indoors, we're lifting capacity, and as well as if they're vaccinated, physical distance is finished. What about masking? Are we, Are we talking okay. about masking in City Hall? No, not City Hall. Never like, like okay. say, um, you know, we have an event coming up at uh, First Ontario. We all have to be vaccinated, but we're saying we're lifting the distance. Are we still mandating the mask indoors? I'm just. Thank you. So Yes, through, through you, Madam Chair. So the city's masking bylaw is still in place. So there are still masking requirements in a number of facilities. Uh, if you like, Councillor Paul is then offline. If you've got a sort of a specific location or, or event, that kind of thing in mind, then we can certainly take a look at that um, specifically. But yes, the city's masking bylaw is still in force and effect. Well, obviously, this uh, Saturday is going to be a great event with Wayside, Step Up for Wayside. I mean, it's okay, but it's a walk and it's a little run that we're doing indoors. We're all vaccinated, making sure there's no physical distance. I just want to make sure we're clear. Do we have to wear a mask while we're walking indoors, uh, um, First Ontario? Thank you, okay. Mr. Thorne. And through you, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't like to give uh, specific answers on specific circumstances okay. without having a quick check-in. So, Councillor Pauls, if we can take that one offline, then we can take a look at that specific event and see if there are any masking requirements that would come into, put into force. And thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any more questions. So it has been moved by Councillor Nan, second by Councillor Jackson to receive the presentation from all three staff members. And we still, are we voting still? Thank you. The voting's good, so we can do the vote. And it's up. And it is clear, unanimous, thank you. Oh, so we're now on, believe it or not, notices of motion. I'm not seeing any, hearing any. So we're on to general information and other business. First, we're doing 13.1 amendments to the outstanding business list. It has been moved by, we're gonna go back to the top of the list again. It's been moved by Councillor Clark, second by to Councillor Danko um, to approve the outstanding business list, the amendments. And the vote, oh, sorry, Councillor Fer uh, Wilson. No, you're muted, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My question pertains to um, 13 point, uh, hold on. Darn it, I can't find it now. Uh, it pertained to an outstanding business item in relation to Shootout Creek and a budgetary plan. There it is, 
13.1AA. Um, the new date, it, the date was September 22nd. The new date as proposed is January the 12th. I'm assuming um, that that has been uh, moved to January because it's going to be addressed within um, our budget deliberations. Could I just get confirmation on that? Thank you. Thank you. And who would like to, is the city manager on or uh, is the GM acting GM for uh, public works available? I'm not seeing any. I'm just checking for Craig Murdoch as well. Oh, there he is. Thank you, Craig. Oh, and Jeanette, thank you very much. We're going to go to, if you don't mind, we'll go to Craig. Um, do you have an answer to that question? If you didn't, uh, Councillor Wilson can repeat it. I'm sorry, Councillor Wilson. Uh, uh, Craig Murdoch, Acting General Manager of Public Works. Could you repeat the question? Of course, Craig, no problem. Um, our attention is now turned to general information and amendments to the outstanding business list. And I'm looking specifically at 13.1 AA and it's titled a uh, budgetary plan to address um, the Shadoke Creek matter. There was a due date of September the 22nd. A proposed new date is January the 12th. My question is, am I correct in assuming it's been moved to January uh, because it's going to be discussed within uh, the city's budget deliberations or is there some other reason? Thank you. Thank you, Craig. I threw you, Madam Chair, that is correct. It is part of the budget deliberations and we will be presenting our budget on November 22nd and it will be covered as part of that process. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, I, I really appreciate it, thank you. Cal um, I have Councillor Clark and I have the clerk waving frantically. Councillor Clark, one moment, please, go ahead. So sorry, I, I just need clarification um, because Craig, you had just said that it's coming forward in November but there's a proposed new due date to bring it back in January. So if it's coming forward in November, the date that they're about to approve of January 12th, 2022 is incorrect. So is it coming forward as part of the capital budget or part of the operating budget? Thank in you, Craig. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, it will be coming forward as part of the budget that will be uh, presented on November 22nd, which is the capital and the operating for Hamilton Water. Okay, so the January 12, 2020 due date is wrong. So we will have to change that to November um, 22nd and, and approve it as amended. Okay, so it's now a November date, not a January date. So that's already been an amendment to the amendment. Councillor Wilson, any other questions? No, okay, thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not sure if my question is in order at this time or I have to wait until we deal with the in camera, but I have questions about 14.3 yeah. and the instructions that we have been told that anyone who sits on the licensing, or not on a licensing tribunal, on the audit finance and administration committee who might be dealing with the DC hearing in the future, were told to recuse themselves. And I'm having challenges trying to understand why we were told to recuse ourselves given all of the past history that I've had on the licensing tribunal, for example, it doesn't happen. We deal with issues that are in our ward that we may or may not have been involved with because there has been no issue uh, raised um, about a conflict in that regard. And yet now on the DC potential hearing, we're being told that we need to recuse ourselves. So I'm struggling okay. to understand the legal yep. reason. I understand Why that is um, the case. if you're if it's OK with you, let's get through the general um, outstanding business list first. And then we're going to discuss the um, the confidence private confidential, as we said at the beginning of the meeting. Hold that thought. I just want to get the amendments to the outstanding business list approved and then we'll move on to that subject. So it's been moved by Councillor Clark, second by Councillor Danko that we approve the amendments. Now the amendments to the amendments to the outstanding business list. Please vote accordingly. Thanks, Stephanie, it's up. And one more item before we go to private confidential, that's your 
by the way. Uh, are there any other items of general information or other business anyone would like to discuss before we go to private and confidential? I'm not seeing any. So now, Councillor Clark, I'm coming to you immediately, and then we will approve the closed minutes, and then we'll talk, and then we'll go in camera. So, Councillor Clark, I believe so our city solicitor is on site. I believe he is here with Steve. Just wait till, there you go. Go ahead, Councillor Clark. So past practice around this table, at least with the licensing tribunal, has been we don't recuse ourselves if it's a matter that's within our ward or if it's a matter that we've been dealing with privately, you still participate on that licensing tribunal. On the audit finance and administration with regards to the hearings, um, the only time I can recall a councillor recusing themselves is Councillor Brenda Johnson and she recused herself and she can explain the reasons, but she made that conscious decision uh, as is her right. Now we're being told we must recuse ourselves. I'm trying to understand what has changed. Thank you, city solicitor, please. Uh, through Deputy Mayor Johnson to Councillor Clark, the issue we have here is one of maintaining independence of the tribunal. So with regards to this form of DC appeal, they arise quite infrequently. Uh, and in this situation, we have a potential settlement of a matter that's going to come before Council GIC uh, to be considered. That settlement will include positions from staff as well as legal advice with regards to exposure on the appeal. That information would prejudice individuals as part of the tribunal should the settlement not be approved by Council and the matter be referred to AFNA as the DC Appeal Tribunal. And it happens quite infrequently, but in this situation, access to that information in detail would remove the element of impartiality required for individuals to sit as part of the DC Appeal Committee, uh, a tribunal as the AFNA committee. And so out of the abundance of caution with regards to the exercise of that unbiased discretion as members of the tribunal, uh, recusing yourself would ensure the integrity of the independence and allow for the tribunal to proceed and render a decision without any potential uh, implications of biasness or a lack of fairness. Thank you, Councillor. So then, uh, Stephen, how would it work then if it's the ward councillor that has been involved in the discussions between staff and um, the appellant and they sit on the AFNA committee? I mean, that's been happening previous to this. So I'm trying to understand why all of a sudden now we're being told, no, you can't hear what's being said in that meeting because apparently it's going to prejudice us, but it didn't prejudice us before this. Uh, through it Deputy seems Mayor to be Johnson, a new policy that's come up. Through Deputy Mayor Johnson to Councillor Clark, I don't believe it's the application of a new process or policy. I think with regards to ward councillors, there, there is an, an understanding that there will be engagement from a council perspective because you have constituents that ask questions and you need to be an advocate on their behalf or you need to understand perspectives. And that's additional information that you may have as ward councillor uh, and you would discharge your obligation as ward councillor in addition to any decision making authority you may have as a member of AFNA. Uh, in this situation, we're talking about the disclosure of settlement terms and conditions, which go beyond uh, the information provided by an individual with an award. And so what we're talking about is in an adversarial uh, approach, which these DC appeals are, the city and staff will be advocating a position in legal advice that once given, a counselor would not be able to exercise independent uh, exercise judgment in an independent basis if they were called upon to do so as part of the tribunal from a DC appeals perspective. And so I think that's the fundamental difference here is the, the level of detail and information associated with the approval of the settlement as opposed to a, a ward resident or constituent providing information to a ward counselor out of concern or looking for guidance or assistance. Thank you, counselor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, right now we can do this out of camera and it's to approve the closed session minutes of October the 20th. And it has been moved by Mayor and uh, Councillor Pauls. Um, and please vote accordingly. 
I just, I keep looking to Stephanie to see whether or not everything's working. So, yeah, go ahead. Madam, sure. so I'm, I'm assuming that the members then of the audit finance committee have to declare a conflict so that we can recuse ourselves. Um, I'm seeing the clerk shake her head. No. However, I'm going to go back to the city solicitor who has been handling this file. Well, city where's solicitor? the record? I'm, I, where's the record going to be that we've recused ourselves? Thank you. So city solicitor through uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson to Councillor Clark. This isn't a conflict per se, like you'd see under MCIA, because there's no pecuniary interest. Uh, this is a potential conflict that could arise uh, in your inability to exercise independent discretion and judgment by having access to ancillary information. Uh, and so that that's fundamentally different. Uh, you would be recusing yourself so you can maintain your independence in the event that the settlement is not approved. Uh, and then you would be able to exercise that independence as a member of the uh, DC Appeals Tribunal, which essentially is the AFNA committee. Thank you, Councilor. So, so my question is more direct. How do we record the fact that we recused ourselves? Thank you. Not participating, not participating in the meeting doesn't mean that we recused ourselves. If we don't declare a conflict or s spell it out in some document, how, is the, how are we going to record the fact that these four councillors recused themselves? Through Deputy Mayor Johnson to Councillor Clark, I believe you would indicate to the clerk that you're recusing yourself for the purposes of the discussion to maintain independence and that you could uh, leave the call uh, to ensure that you don't receive any information that would be inappropriate or provide you with a, a, what could be viewed as a biased approach to a matter. And so I think it's it's important that the clerk acknowledge that to be recorded and that you preserve your independence by taking those actions. And, so, and Mr. Uh, Clerk, just to add a little more context to the, the question you asked earlier in open uh, session, now that we're in closed session. We're not in closed, not session, in closed yet. session, sir. Oh, I apologize. I thought we, we haven't approved that yet. Well, that's what I'm, the question asking in open I'm, session. Madam, Madam, Madam Clerk, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, to the clerk, then how are we yes. going to record the fact that we're recusing ourselves? I, I, Thank I, you. I apologize that's for that, Councilor Clerk. And uh, Deputy Mayor, I uh, apologize. That's for okay. That well. No, that's okay. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, Councillor Clark, we, uh, what I will be doing is noting all members of the Audit Finance and Administration Committee that are present, and I will be listing your names, have recused themselves from the meeting for that item so that you can maintain the separation between the two. And of course, that's not the exact wording I'll be using, but it will be recorded in the minutes. I just appreciate the fact that it's being recorded in the minutes so that no one can come Perfect. back on us then. Thank you. Absolutely, sir. No, thank you. That's good. So, um, here we go. Oh, sorry, Councillor Vanderbeek, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> Just on that note, I, I would like some clarification. So, will that be in the closed session minutes, which no one will see, or will it be in the open session minutes where uh, people will, the public will know, and the people who are involved in that hearing will know, that we, as members of the AFNA committee, recused ourselves. If Thank you. The clerk would like to answer you. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, it will be noted in the public minutes that Councillors Ferguson, Wilson, Pearson, Johnson, Vanderbeek, and Clark, who currently sit on the AFNA committee, will be recusing themselves for that reason. And it will be in the public minutes. Thank, thank you, you Madam. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you. And folks, that's just for 14.3. We are still going in for 14.2 and 14.3. So um, it has been moved by Councillor Farr, seconded by Councillor Marula, uh, that we go into closed session respecting items 14.2 and 14.3 pursuant to section 9.1, subsections E, F, and K of the city's procedural bylaw 21-21. Um, in section 2392, subsections E, F, and K of the Ontario Municipal Act 2001, as amended as the subject pertains to, one, litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, 
to advice that this subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, and three, a position plan, procedure, criteria, or instructions to be applied to any negotiation carried on or be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. So the vote will be up. Please vote accordingly. And the vote and is then, just missing Councillor Marula. Councillor Marula, thumb up. Do you have a question? He's got his thumb. Okay. All right. Um, so for the members of the public, the meeting will continue. Follow the, the closed session portion of the meeting when you see the members of council rejoin. To, to all my other colleagues, please make sure you're in a secure area and that you're in the closed session portion of the, your of your e scribe. And any staff that are not directly related to items 14.2, I'm going to say 14.3, not 14.2. Oh, sorry, both are also asked to please exit the WebEx meeting.
Just a reminder to everybody that we are in open and we are recording, so we are just waiting a few moments for those members who had to recuse themselves from the meeting to come back in and uh, just a very quick break for those who required it. Hello, Councillor Clark, we are recording, we are live, we are just waiting for people to join back in, so we'll just be a moment. Okay, folks, we are live, so be careful what you say. Um, One, two, three. We're just waiting for quorum. Only have seven waiting for mm -hmm. Tom and Judy. Is there anybody else? A few people uh, uh, just dead stepped away for a quick moment. And your answer, Mr. Mayor, is yes. <laughs> Thank you. That was does a that, code. <laughs> does, that, does that include the item that we dealt with in camera? Uh, no, actually. Thank you. No. Sorry, I didn't read your whole email. I just saw it pop up. And... No. Well, I, I didn't ask that part. I thought I was okay. leading it, but I thought you would fill in the blank. Took me a moment. So, no, she will have to... Um, Unless you would just want to continue the chair for the open portion. That How might be the best it? way to go, Mr. Mayor. If you don't mind. What's that? That 
I can do 14.2. I'll go to um, Councillor Clark for his emotion, and then I'll turn the chair over to you for 14.3. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yep. that'd be great. Now, I, would, I would again, Madam Clerk, say that those that were on audit and finance are going to have to. The only um, through Mr. Deputy Mayor, no, there is no conflict. The only thing is that they will not be able to vote. Um, the only thing that we're voting on is that the report. Uh, wait a second here. Go to fourteen three. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, sorry, it just fell out of my binder. Sorry, we are live, so I just want to make sure really quick. Oh, we have time, <clears throat> so you can figure that out. We can. Yes, they will. Right. They will have to um, not vote on right. those two items. Or abstain. Or, or on fourteen point three, but I need you. They, why don't they just leave as long as we have quorum because then I can adjourn. That's easier. Okay. Okay. Right. Just so we know in advance. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So welcome back everyone. We're now back in open session 14.2 farmers market rent relief and governance comparators LS 21036A. I believe we're going to go to Councillor Clark first for an amendment and then we're going to uh, go for a vote um, as amended. So, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I believe the motion, as I remember it, was to refer options one through seven to the appropriate staff for a report back to a future GIC. Councillor Clark, it's on the screen for you. Oh my God, I almost remembered it. That staff be directed to review. Oh, can you make it any smaller for me? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm just okay, old. Direct. <laughs> yeah. Direct. Okay, there you go. Uh, that staff be directed to review the following options with respect to the Hamilton Farmers Market and report back to the general issues with recommendations and alternative options. Uh, do you want me to read out all of those? Because I can't scroll it. You I could certainly read them out. That, do why want? don't you do that, please? That would just okay. make it easier. Thank you. Use of the community improvement plan as it relates to the Hamilton Farmers Market. The provision of financial support to the Hamilton Farmers Market to enable the market to work with and provide indirect support to vendors on the adoption of new commercial initiatives such as e-commerce and technological sharing via an online virtual market. Encourage the Hamilton Farmers Market to consider longer term license agreements with vendors using a minimum base fee with the balance of fees owed as a percentage of sales. Revisions to the conditions of an operating agreement between the City of Hamilton Farmers Market Corporation and the degree to which the entity is governed by provisions of the Municipal Act, including the provisions referenced in Section 106, to be considered if aligned with the recommended outcomes of the governance review. The provision of further and specific marketing campaign support on the benefits of healthy and fresh food, for example, less handling than large retail and Hamilton Farmers Market as part of the urban food system with proximity and access to transportation. That and should not be in there. In conjunction with the Economic Development uh, Division, connect arts and craft vendors to the market with Tourism Hamilton to promote tourism and market attendance and develop and support outreach and partnership initiatives between the Hamilton Farmers Market and Community Gardens and urban and rural grow a row providers to promote local agriculture and the purchase of goods through the Hamilton Farmers Market. And that would be for a report back. So Madam Deputy Mayor and Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to yield the sponsoring of this motion to Councillor Pauls, who's who's our representative on the farmers market. And I I, I can second it or Councillor Farr can second it. I'm just I'm the key for me was to get the motion there. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I got it down for you for um, Councillor Pauls to um, move the motion and Councillor Clark to second it. Uh, I have mayor, the mayor and Councillor Farr on a speaker's list. So, um, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And um, I'm, uh, I'm supportive of uh, having some report back on uh, many of these items. But I do want to uh, put Council on notice that I will be asking or working with staff on, on a, uh, a motion to explore the feasibility of uh, private sector uh, operations and management of the farmer's market. And I'll bring that to uh, Council at the appropriate time. Hopefully, uh, well thought out uh, uh, that we can fit into a process that um, will allow for multiple considerations of options as we as we work through the the governance review. So, 
I will, uh, at the appropriate time, bring that to council and just wanted to share that I'll, I'll be bringing that forward um, as soon as we can uh, fashion something that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that heads up. Councillor Farr. Yes, can we um, also uh, forward this, should it pass to um, or refer it to that governance review process, which is being reported back to this body uh, first quarter, I believe, 2022. And um, either that governance process can can include this request, the report back, um, so it can be in conjunction with it or or at least follow it. And um, so far, Councillor Clark is the uh, mover, so I'll ask him if that makes sense. Well, actually it's Councillor Pauls that's the mover, but Councillor Clark's put his thumb up as well, so we, we're okay to go. They so we're gonna put did, that on so as I'm an fine. amendment, please, um, Clerk. They both did. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That exhausts the speakers list and it has been duly moved and seconded. Please vote accordingly. My scribe's acting up, so I'm thumbs up, please. Progress. Yes, just bear with me. Councillor Ferguson mm -hmm. is gone. Councillor Vanderbeek is not here. And Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Johnson, you're okay. So I'm going to close the vote. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone. It, thank you. So now it is uh, that the rest of the report or the report respecting the farmer's market rent relief and governance comparatives remain confidential for the legal advice. So it has been duly moved again by Councillor Paul, seconded by Councillor Farr. Please vote accordingly. I just have to throw that all into one vote, so it's an as amended. So just as amended. One quick moment. That's probably folks. better. That's why she's the clerk and I'm not. Okay, that should work. There you. Go. Thumbs up for me as well, please. Councillor Farr, oh, there you go. Closes. Thank you. 10 to zero. Thank you. And I'm now going to turn the chair over to the mayor for 14.3 as I need to recuse myself and abstain from the voting. As I well as the rest of the AFNA. Right. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And that includes all members of uh, audit and finance. At this point, we'll need to vacate the meeting and hopefully we'll have forum left when that happens. So thank you all for your attendance and uh, have a good afternoon. And of clerk, I'm going to leave it to you to decide uh, who is appropriately here yes. and who's not. Give me just one quick second here. We're just going to make sure everybody's gone. Yes, we're good. One, two, three, eight. We're good. All right, okay. good. And uh, again, uh, in open session, I don't have the recommendation in front of me. Did you want to? Uh, I can certainly read it out. For the benefit um, of everyone, either put it on the screen or read it out. Yeah. Yes, I'll do both. It can, I just have a mover and seconder so that I can pull it up. Thank you. Uh, on, a, on a motion uh, moved by Councillor Pauls, seconded by Councillor Jackson. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to read it out loud. So the motion, i sorry, I just lost it here, is that the direction provided closed session, respect and report LS21042, FCS21108, instructions regarding the proposed settle development charge, complaint by Trillium Housing Winona nonprofit, and sorry, and Trillium Housing Highbury nonprofit be approved. And that report LS21042 FCS21108 respecting the instructions regarding the same remain confidential. That's great. Thank you. Thank so you. it's been moved and seconded. I need Councillor Pauls, Marula, Jackson, and Farr to vote, please. Yep. And Councillor Danko as well, I believe. Oh, there you go. They were just all waiting until you finished. Sorry, folks. Yeah. Carries eight to zero. Just, just being polite. Don't want to mess up the voting process. 
Anything else we need to deal with uh, beyond that at this point, uh, Madam Clerk? No, just your adjournment. I, I think that will be done with enthusiasm. Moved by Farr, seconded by Pauls, and Partridge, and Marula, and Jackson, and everyone else. All in favor? I'm opening, oh, sorry. Madam Clerk? Yeah, there we go. It's coming. You're all, all slightly waiting for you to put it up. Because you're doing such a fabulous job. And that carries eight to zero. All right. Okay. Thank you, so Thank you Thank everybody. You, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Thank day. You. Excellent job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Here at City Hall.